so listen, thanks very much for talking to us tonight. Um, and and I guess my first question I have to ask you is is how do I address you? Just fish. We're going, we're going by fish. You're not Derek. No, no. I tend to uh, Derek's retained for uh, close friends and family. I Fair do enough. answer. I do answer to both names, but. You know, when it's working, when it's music business, it's fish, you know? No, no fair enough. That, that does make perfect sense. And then, I guess this is a question you've probably been asked more than once before, but but how do we refer to you these days? Um, I mean, at what point did you stop being the ex Marillion front man? At what point did you become Fish the solo artist in his own right? Well, as far as I'm concerned, I've been I've been Fish the artist in my own right forever. The ex Marillion singer is the... The, the the tag of blicket here for like you know most especially red tops you know yeah yeah it gets a, it gets a bit irritating when you know I mean you know fair enough it's kind of you know I had the biggest singles that I've ever been involved with right. were during my 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 period with Marillion but I mean you know I've been out of the band since nineteen I left in nineteen eighty eight right right and moved back to Scotland in nineteen eighty nine so it's a fair whack you know right yeah I think you know it, I think it depends on what's your biggest hit and then that's what you get called you know no, no fair so, enough uh, but uh, you know it's stipulated in my will that it shall not be put in my gravestone that it's ex <laughs> Marillion singer first you know no, that sounds reasonable yeah fair enough so, so well, it's when, it's when, when you when you normally do interviews with like you know local BBC stations. It's like, hello there. Well, he's he's brilliant singer fish and yeah, uh, he's we're gonna be playing his new single in a minute. But here for now, ding 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 yes. ding ding ding. And then you know the the ever present tones of Kaylee come out. So but you know it's just something you live with. You know, I mean it's yeah. like it can get irritating sometimes, I think. You know, well, like we've been going for Garden of Remembrance that uh, which is the track of Welsh yeah. as you probably know. Mm. I'm trying to take that to radio in Holland, where you know Holland have been, have been pretty supportive of my so, my solo career, right. you know, at, at radio. But I mean, even then, it's like you know, my 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 major guy was going crazy. He said, "Oh, they want to do is play Kaylee," and it's right. like it, it, it's part of the decision to give up. Because I mean, the one thing I definitely did not want to be doing was like being 65, 70 year old playing Kaylee in the chicken in a basket circuit. You know what I mean? <laughs> you know? Uh, yeah. Please well, welcome on stage, ex million singer fish playing his hit. You know. Yeah, I mean, it's a sweet enough song to be fair, but yeah, I can see how it would get a wee bit old after a while. It's a great song. I love the song. It's great. I don't play it regularly no. in my set by any stroke, stroke of the imagination. But you know, I mean, the, the thing is, it's like I've had great songs in my solo career, but the difference between my solo career and you know having those, those songs were Marillion was that we had the monster that is EMI behind it, right? right. And I think, you know, when you've got a major record company that's pushing your albums and pushing your singles, then you do have a little bit more oomph, you know? Yeah. So, well, yeah, it's fair enough. You know, like I said, I mean, you know, I, I'm, I'm proud of what I've done and, you know, it stands as my legacy and I'm, I'm happy with it. You know, and I've got, it's, in, it's been interesting with this album because I designated it as my last album that, yeah. you know, even when we got the fight and mixes through and my wife and I sat through in the room and, and listened to them, it was a, there was a, there was a sense of completion. There was a sense of, you know, um, I was, I, it felt like it was my last album, and I, I wasn't, I, I was relieved, you know. I think mm. the industry has changed completely since I joined, you know, since I sent you my nineteen eighty two. I mean, back in nineteen eighty two, you know, your formats were vinyl, cassette, and then you had the seven inch, twelve inch single with a color yeah. disc, and then. 1985 was when Miss Place came out, was when Welcome to the World of CDs. Of course, yes. And then as we, I mean, we moved into the 90s and then suddenly we're in the downloads and, and everything. I mean, I mean, even now I find it really strange, you know, putting an album out. There's a there's a sense of isolation and remoteness, you know, to putting an album out. I mean, you know, you're sitting down there in Auckland and you've heard the album and it's, yes. you, know, you know, I was brought up with a thing where, you know, people had physical vinyl. So, you know, you have this kind of strange ether release of an album and mm. you're, you're kind of detached from it and you're then discussing it with, with strangers on a, on a Skype link or whatever it's, it's, it's become quite strange, you know Oh, it's absolutely bizarre, yeah, but you mentioned the new album Velschmerz, it's coming out later this month, right? Yeah, it's out on September the 25th, so uh, where we've been preparing this album, I mean the idea for the album came up in 2015 but, you know, in reality we didn't, I didn't really start <clears throat> putting the pen to the paper until uh, the end of 2017. But I mean, it's been, you know, the album creation, the writing, the 
you know, the entire project has been plagued by, you know, so many spanners, like some very poisonous spanners that were getting thrown about, you know. I mean, um, you know, the idea came up in 15, and I was on the road for most of 15. Then I had to do a spinal injury. I had to go for an operation where, in, at the end of 16. But before that, my father died That's in the right. May, just after the tour. And that kind of really threw me. I, I, you know, although you mentally prepare for it, when you're aware of somebody that's got an illness and you know there's an end game, and you kind of mentally prepare yourself for, like, eventually, you know, the whistle is going to blow. And then it happens, and then it really threw me. And I spent seven months basically losing myself and then finding myself in the garden. And then I had, like I said, operations to go through in the 17, was when I wrote really the first lyric for Little Man What Now. And then, you know, after that, I had various other things, including, you know, in 2019, I had sepsis twice, which oh, was, that was the scariest part of the whole How world. did that come about? Just an infection I picked up. It was oh, a depleted, depleted immune system, which what happened with cellulitis in 2017. I, I was basically run down. I was doing, right. I was working 14 hours a day through in the office, sorting out a tour. And, um, and I ran myself into the ground. And then I got a, a tiny cut in my leg and it became cellulitis. Right. But the following year, it came back as sepsis. And it came back twice within the space of three months, four months. But that was scary. I mean, that was like, a blue light in an ambulance and, you know, mm -hmm. into the, the, the Edinburgh Royal Infirmary. But, I mean, it was like, you know, halfway there, it was like you know, the paramedic pulled over, put oxygen on me, and he said, look, look, another 40 minutes and you'd be going into critical. Oh, so, you know, there was a, there was definitely, there was a, there was a, a definite you know, shuffling around the, the mortal, mortal coil, right, yeah. in 2019, which, you know, it did have an effect on the album, I mean, and a very positive effect on the album, you know. Well, at what point did you decide it was going to be your last album? Mm. 2015. I was yeah. living in Germany. I was spending about four months of my year in Germany. My, my wife Simona comes from Karlsruhe down in the south of Germany, and um, I was spending four months a year out there. And I mean, definitely immersed in the Germanic. I mean, I, I learned German at school. My first wife was from Berlin. My daughter, who's 30 year old this year, she's half German. So I mean, I've, I've definitely have a twirl of the Germanic within me. Right. And um, I know it's kind of, I've been out there and it was, I was out there just at the start of the, the, the Syrian uh, revolution and the Syrian war. And at the same time, you know, there was all the refugees flooded and especially in the southern Germany where we were. So, you know, there was a lot of things that was catching up on. And, and I think, you know, like all of us, you know, you put on the TV and sometimes you can get, you, you feel overwhelmed by the information that's coming at you, you know, and you feel helpless because it's out of your remit, you know, and, you know, you either slip into apathy, you slip into depression or whatever. And it's it's trying to keep yourself buoyed and 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 within the game. And at 2.15, the Ultramount seemed to sum it up. And, right. and then at the end of 15, you know, when I came, I was on tour. I was I was actually on a train from the north of Germany heading down to Karlsruhe with, ironically, a respiratory infection in the mm -hmm. middle of the tour. And the Bataclan, the news of the Bataclan. Oh, right, yeah. The, on the, the Facebook pages while I was on the on the on the road on a train heading through Germany. And that was a big shock. It was suddenly, right. I mean, everybody was aware that there was the possibility. I mean, you know, I'm speaking to somebody in New Zealand. I mean, everybody's aware of that possibility. But I mean, you know, there is always, you know, that horrific screenplay available. But I mean, you know, when it actually happens, you know, it was it was a it was a big hit. And I remember walking into the gig, you know, when a, a couple of days later I went into the, the, the first gig and I walked in and it was the first thing I'm looking at is the exits. And the first thing I'm looking at is where's the security? You know, right. it was, it, I mean, it, it, it was a, a, a huge detonation, you know, underneath the, the music industry when, when that happened. And of course, with that and the Charlie Hebdo thing as well that, that had happened previously, I mean, it was, but it was when the music business became, a, you know, a, a kind of a recognized target. Right, you know, and that was scary, you know. And I really felt for you guys there in New Zealand when that all happened. I mean, you know, when you know that, that was just shocking, you know, it's yeah, just absolutely you. shocking. But I mean, it's all part of this. I mean, they will burn me at the stake as a witch, I think, in the next year, two years, you know, <laughs> because it's like bringing an album called Velchmelt's Pain of the World, yeah, out and, and and this in 2020, you know, it's uh. 
Yeah. yeah. But it but it is to be fair. It's, I mean, it's a very very personal album, isn't it? I mean, it's it's. I, I, I mean, we 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 can talk all you like about about your the characters you've created in the past, but this is you, isn't it? This is this is a pretty naked album. Well, I think you know if you look at my, my the, the history of, of my lyrical career, I mean, I think scripted for Gazi before the first two albums they did with Marilli, and they were very guarded. They were very. Um, uh, I, w- I wasn't confident in how I was expressing myself, but I think. When I go to misplaced shell, dude, I opened up and I felt right. confident in how I was feeling and I was expressing my feelings. And that's kind of carried on right the way through all my solo releases. But this album kind of threw me because I made a, I made a, a decision, like a, a, a very... Um, I was very aware that I wanted to write this album in third person. Right. And, I, and I've discussed this with Mark Wilkinson, who does all my artwork since right. Marcus Studios days. I mean, and Mark and I talk a lot about the stuff, and we were talking about, you know, Belchmerts and how they're dealing with it. And I can't use first person all the way through it. Mm-hmm. So I decided to invest in third person. And, and, and because I wanted to write about characters, I wanted to write, I didn't want to write about me dealing with the world. I wanted to take characters dealing with their own problems within the world situation because I didn't want to write about big politics. I didn't want to write about big government, big corporation, big bank shit. Yeah. I want to strip it all down to people. So, and that, that's what I do best, observational writing. And by taking characters and having them deal with certain situations that are prevalent in, in the world that we live in, and they are everyday world problems, there was, um, to slip in a third character made it a bit easier to write. But then as the album progressed, and as the writing progressed, I found I was investing more and more or my own experiences within within the characters in the album, and then and, and as such, it became uh, a, a lot more autobiographical. Autobiographical, you know. Now that does make sense. I mean, I was listening to to Waverly Steps, which I mean, obviously the subtitle of that song, "End of the Line," sort of speaks volumes about where you're going with this album, anyway. Yeah. But you know, the sign says, "Back in the day, no one cared and no one worried. It was just about being alive." Mm. And and I'm I'm assuming that was we're, we're going back to the early days here, yeah. Yeah, I mean, Waverly Steps. What inspired Waverly Steps was a story in the Edinburgh Evening News, and it was about an ex-soldier who had um, um, PTSD, and he refused to kind of deal with uh, he refused to deal with social services. He just wanted to be completely independent. He didn't want to go into um, homes or whatever and he decided he, he was just going to live rough and he was mainly found uh, sleeping rough on the Waverly Steps and he became right. an identifiable character there and then one winter, uh, a couple of winters ago, it was um, I read an article in the same paper basically saying that he, he'd frozen to death, he died on the steps Right. and it kind of hit me, you know and, and I've had a lot of experiences with the army in the past through you know shows that we've done with them in Bosnia Kosovo and stuff, so you know, I've, I've I've got a lot of relationships with ex-soldiers and things, and <clears throat> that was it was something that was close to my heart. But that was kind of tied up with the fact that when I live in East Lothian, which is just to the south of Edinburgh, there's the mainline London, the, the mainline London Edinburgh uh, uh, railway runs past us, a small a small village near us, and um, and it's notorious for suicides. Oh, right. And it's always reported in the local paper as, you know, um, tragic death or whatever, you know, blah, blah, blah. Nobody goes into detail. And and on top of that, I mean, I've got a friend of mine who's um, a train driver. And I was talking to him about it. And he was saying that, you know, that it, it, there was a lot more suicides in the last three years, which I'd noticed from my own reading, you mm-hmm. know, media reading. And, uh, and you know, he'd, he talked about, you know, as a, dr- a driver, you know, what they were told, like in these big trains that are like, that I've got, you cannot break within a certain distance. No. Um, they're told to basically, allegedly, told to go into the back of the cabin and basically shut the door and like hit the brakes and let the train break and they've just got to go in. So when the impact happens, they don't see it. So you know, say there's nothing you can do. There's no point in watching it. Right. And you know those kind of things hit me, and that was when the idea for Waverly Steps came about. And, and on top, I live in a country, and I, I live in a, a beautiful county where, you know, it's been built up and built up as are in all beautiful places and the suburbia expands and villages join together. And you, you're watching the land being just decimated and torn apart and, and replaced by shitty houses. 
and that all kind of came into it. And then suddenly, I put my own experiences of being when I was a teenager and stuff, and, and, and through them and, and through a couple of. I went out. We recorded it in, in 2018. I took it out on the road at the end of that year. Right. And it was when I was actually singing it on stage. I went, "Fuck me!" You know, I realised that that's you know, there's a lot of me in this. You know? Right. Right. And you know, I, I, there's a lot of things.